Hi. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to thank uh, the organizers for having me again, second time that I'm speaking at Doggo. And I'm very happy to be here. Last time, uh, apparently, people liked my talk. So I tried not to do a good talk this time. And I'm going to be talking about something really weird that I've been trying to do for a while. And I'm not sure it's a good idea. <laughs> but <laughs> I had lots of fun doing it. And the end result is actually not that bad. So let's talk about functional programming in Go. The first question that one could answer, could, could ask it himself, is why? <laughs> and basically, it's just because uh, if you remember my last talk, my talk last year, I was talking about how it's good to learn other, other, other programming languages. And I've been learning uh, Haskell for quite a while, and I really love it. So I decided that maybe there was something in that language, Haskell, that could be applied to Go to make our Go code better. Maybe. The two things that I really like of programming, uh, of functional programming, are one the, is the fact that this is a quick sort algorithm, and it's complete. And that, that's beautiful. That's really elegant. And first time I read it, I, it just blew my mind. I was like, well, OK, I, I really like this. I want to write this in Go. And you kind of can do it, but at the same time, it's pretty hard. So I decided to actually invest a little bit more time on this and see where it, did, where it went. The second thing is that I'm on stage quite often, but I'm never as cool as this guy. Uh, if you know this guy, this is Andrew Sorensen, and he did a keynote at OSCON two years ago where he did live coding of music, so basically using functional programming to become a DJ. And that's really badass. So I wanted to be like him one day. So I, I thought that maybe I could do functional Go to generate music, but I, didn't know, I did not get there. <laughs> OK, so what is functional programming? Functional programming is just programming with basically two big constraints. The first one is that there is no mutable state. Second one is that functions are everywhere. Functions are the most important thing. There's first class objects. So can we do this in Go? Well, for the first part, not having mutable state is really a choice. Go doesn't force you to have mutable state. So if you declare a variable and never change it, then you don't have mutable state. Easy. And the problem with that is that all of a sudden, you have to say goodbye to for loops, because for loops have an index variable that's variable that keeps on changing, right? So you cannot do this anymore. You cannot do this because this is not functional, because there's two things. Uh, there's that v variable and the s variable. Both are uh, mutating over time. That's not functional. You cannot do it. So easy. You write it in recursion. And the code is actually even simpler. It's one line less, and it's beautiful. I really like it. Little bit of an issue, it's 10 times lower. <laughs> so that's an issue. So what do I do? It's like, oh, that's because recursion is actually quite expensive because I'm doing function calls all the time. So instead of doing that, I'm going to do tail recursion. And tail recursion is basically when the last thing you do in the function call is actually calling the function. And here, that's not, that's not tail recursion because we're adding, we're calling the function and then adding one number on top. So that's not good. We can modify the algorithm. And now that's actually the modified version that does actually tail recursion. And then it's actually slower. <laughs> so that's not good either. So what's going on? Well, Go doesn't have tail recursion optimization because probably we don't really need it. You don't do functional programming in Go, really. Like, you should not do that. So, What's the problem here? Well, we don't have optimization. So I'm just going to fake it, fake it till you make it. And I just add a go to. <laughs> this is actually the equivalent. <laughs> this is the equivalent to what the, uh, the optimization could do. So I'm just faking it for a little bit. And we go down to actually only three times slower than the for loop, which is pretty good. Uh, considering that this is actually doing bound checking and the for loop is not. That's, pretty, that's a pretty decent performance. So what's the, what's the uh, conclusion of this first part? We're not doing this for speed, clearly. <laughs> that's not the point. OK, second part, functions are first class objects. So that means that we can use functions everywhere. You can pass functions as parameters. You can return functions. You can have maps of functions. You can do whatever you want with functions. And with Go, you can do that. So done, cool. What's the next step? Well, as soon as you start thinking about functions that get functions as parameters, 
these names are going to start appearing, right? You're going to have map, filter, fold, and these kind of things. And I decided, well, let's try to implement one. Let's go with map. I like Haskell. And in Haskell types, you could write the map has this type, which is given a function that given apples give you pies, if you pass it a list of apples, it will return a, a list of pies. Quite simple. Um, it's magic because you get apples, but you generate strawberry pies. That's good. <laughs> if we have a concrete type and we say, OK, apples are not apples, they're ints, and uh, pies are bulls, uh, writing that in Go is actually quite simple. And we can write this function that it's a map function over those types. And it works really well. Uh, we can call it. Uh, so actually, there's a little bit of a problem because slices grow uh, the you append at the end normally. While functional programming is more you append at the beginning, you prepend even though it's not a word. Uh, so what you want to do is change the order. So this is pretty much the same thing, just slightly better and faster, actually. Cool. So I have this. I can use it. It works. But no one is happy with this. Because uh, the problem is that what if I have now a function that it's from float64 to boolean? Do I have to write it again? And the answer is yes. But you could also fix it using empty interfaces and reflection. And that's what I did. So if Go had generics, <laughs> Go doesn't have generics, though. So you're going to write this. The function that given a type, any type returns another any type uh, doesn't exist. So you have to write as an empty interface. The slice of types, you have to write as an empty interface. And the slice of the other type, also empty interface. Which means that the function ends up being a function that, given an interface, an interface returns an empty interface. And that, that's quite ugly. That's my face. <laughs> I really don't appreciate this kind of code. So the next step is, well, yeah, we've been told embrace the interface. Don't overdo it. Like, that's a little bit too many interfaces in there. So I'm going to start trying to get rid of those empty interfaces and having some concrete types that will help me have some, an API that is more usable. The first thing that I'm going to try to do is I'm going to replace that function with something more usable. So I define this type, func, that has three, three values, the input type, the output type, and then the function itself, and a method to call it. That's very simple. Nothing really matching in here. The cool thing is that I can now call new func. And the important thing of this code is that basically the first lines that I'm actually omitting, those are what, in Haskell, the type system could do. So I'm just very fine that what you passed is indeed a function that has one parameter and one output. Uh, the same way, if you had some composition, you could actually check that the composition over the functions, the types match, and so on. So basically, you have to write some part to compensate for the lack of uh, very, very fancy type system. Instead, you have to write, it's four lines of code total. So it's not crazy. And then the return is the function actually calls the function given the values. I add must because uh, I want to write this in tests all the time. So must basically, if, you, if new func fails, just panic. Um, and I use this only in tests, of course. So now we've, we've gone from this map function that given an empty interface and an empty interface returns an empty interface to something that given a func and an interface returns an empty interface, which is slightly better, but still not perfect. I would like to get rid of this. What's this empty interface? Well, this empty interface is something that we can call that function on. And that's actually quite an interesting idea. We can start with one simple example, which is a list. You can call things on list. And I define my list from scratch, because Go provides a list. Uh, there's a package list in the standard library, but it's a double linked list. And I prefer to have a simple linked list. The good thing with simple linked lists is they're really simple to write. So that's the whole code for it. That's it. So when I do map, what I do is I return a list on which the first element is the result of calling the function on the first element of the input. And then I do recursive call. That's it. So should, is, should this map here be a method instead of a function? And if it is, on what? On func or on list? And if you think about this, if you had it on func, then for every single type that you can call that function on, you could have a method on that type, which is not probably what you want. But if you do it the other way, then what you have is every single list, every single 
type of container list or whatever you want to call it, defines the way you can call a function over it. So I write this function, map on list, that returns an empty list. You can call it, you can use it, and it works. So if you pass two empty string, two uh, lowercase strings, hello and by returns upper hello, uppercase hello, uppercase by. And uh, I'm using actually strings to upper, so you can use any function. You just uh, uh, you get, you decorate that function so you can use it with the API. That's it. Okay, let's talk about something weird: type classes. Type classes are interesting because if you come from uh, pro oriented programming, they're actually not types really, neither classes. So what they are is they are constraint over types. So in this case, this is like an actual class from Haskell, uh, an actual type class from Haskell. And it says that uh, something that satisfies that type class show is something with a method show that given a value of that type returns a string. And if you write this in Go, you get exactly this, an, an interface. It's like, OK, so type classes are interfaces. Easy. Now you go to the next step, and you say, what about equals? Equals is given two values of the same type, it returns a Boolean. And then you try to do that with an interface, and you say, well, equitable, or however you pronounce that, I'm not completely sure about that one. Well, you call equal, and you pass another equitable, and it returns a Boolean. But that's not what I want to write. What I want to write is an integer compared to an integer, right? So it's not exactly the same idea. So we can say that type classes are like functors, and be fine with that. Uh, sorry, interfaces, I said functors. Forget functors for now. <laughs> OK, what else can we map over? Uh, we said it will be mapped over a list, but we can also map over maps, over trees, over pretty much any single idea you could have of stuff that has types inside. You could, you could basically find a way of calling that. And you could define an interface saying, well, Anything that has this map function that, given a function, returns something of the same type that you are mapping over, that's, that's a mapper. And you cannot really write that in Go, because uh, you cannot just have that return type changing for every single type. That's not a thing that works. You could actually do it, and it's really interesting. And if I do this talk again in a much longer format, I will talk about that. It's quite interesting thing that happens. But if you have that, that interface, I could actually write that as a type class. And that's exactly what a functor is, which is a very fancy word, so it sounds really cool. But a functor is basically something that, given a function from A to B, or from apples to pies, uh, and something made of apples, it returns something made of pies. So basically this, with a building a man as something made of apples. Important thing is that both building men are exact, exactly the same type. So basically, if you have a list, returns a list. OK, so what is a functor? A functor is many things. Actually, everything we said so far are functors. Uh, maps uh, could be functors. Lists are functors. Slices could be functors. So many of them. But there's some of them that are actually quite useful. One of them is maybe. And maybe it's, it's actually a functor, and people call, like, there's actually things about functors that you might have heard before, talking about monads. The only thing I'm going to say about monads is that they're really hard, and I'm not going to talk about them. But functors are like simplified monads that I understand. So what is maybe? So maybe it's just something that has a value. Maybe. It could have a value, or it could not have a value. When you call map on it, if there's a value, it calls the function if, and returns the value. If there is no value, it doesn't come to call the function. That's it. So that's quite interesting. Uh, you can use it. And passing a maybe with, an empty, uh, with a string inside, it will actually call the function and return a maybe with a different string that, that's uppercased. You could call it without the string, and everything would just work uh, without having to check if that value is not, because the, uh, the maybe functor is able to do that. You can even link those and ma have one after the other. So now what I'm doing is like, oh, yeah, I want to get hello, and then uppercase, and then double that. And then from lowercase hello, I'm going to get uppercase hello, hello. Let's think about this. I'm, I'm trying to do better emojis with, over time, so this is pretty good effort. Imagine that you have a person that has an address, 
that has, the, so the city, the address is inside of a city, and the city has some weather. So you can write all of this code, and I'm actually writing fields and methods, and there's a reason for that. I'll explain it in a minute. If I wanted to get the weather for the city where the person lives, the way I should do it could be something like this. I could check, well, what's the address? Is it nil? No, okay, so then get the city. Is it nil? No, okay, then get the weather, and so on. And this is fine, and very often you should write this code, really. Like, don't feel ashamed, this is the code you write, because this is the normal code we should be writing. But using maybe, you can do things like this. You can create a maybe of that and say, well, I'm gonna map a function which is the result of passing a person and getting the pointer to address inside. And that's awful. That's really ugly. <laughs> but something that is quite interesting is that that function that giving a person returns a pointer to address is already defined for us. We don't need to write it. That's actually the same value as person.address because we can get a method value from a type. We can get it from a value, a variable. So if you get uh, the uh, address method from the variable p, that's a function that returns a pointer to address. But if you get it from person, it's a function that given a person returns a pointer to address. So we can use that. So now we can write this. And this is pretty nice, too, but not that nice either. <laughs> We're still having that map must new func every single time. So what I did was I defined a new function that I called do, that what it does, it just does exactly that. So given a bunch of functions, it just tries to adapt all of those functions and call them recursively. So now I can call this. So I can do maybe p do person address, address city, city weather, weather description, and then check if that's empty or not. And that starts to be kind of nice. And if you've, used some, if you've done some C sharp, you might recognize this something like link, which is quite interesting. And if you've done some C sharp and you've used link, the next one could not surprise you, which is many. Many is not one, but many. And it looks like a list, but there's a big difference with list. List is for a list of elements. It calls the function and returns as many elements as you had at the beginning. What we do here is the if the, method, the function that we call returns more than one value, it returns a list of elements, we will actually append that, so every single element. So given something like this, uh, we'll have the same behavior then for list. So given two values, hello there and goodbye, and we just uppercase that we will get two values at the end. But if we use string fields, string.fields will return as many, value, as many values as it's needed. So for uh, hello there, we'll return hello and there, and goodbye, good, and bye. So now I'm actually getting four values. So now let's use another use case, which is a library has many books, books has many pages, and a page has many lines, and that's the closest emoji I found for line. So we can define something quite similar, which is uh, all the same structs with slices and so on and methods to obtain them. And we could write this code. If we want to obtain, if we want to count how many times every single word appears in all the books in the library, we could do this. And that works. And you should write that, probably. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that many, many uh, functor. So you end up doing, again, the same thing, uh, maps, must, new func. But then you can use also do to simplify all of this. And you're then writing something like this, where you say do library books, books, book pages, page lines, line text, strings field, which is not a method, but it's a function with the good type, so it still works. And it returns many fields. And then we're calling this function uh, that it's actually returning a Boolean just because my function, my implementation, says that it has to return something. So if it didn't return anything, this could just not work. So I'm just counting that word, and it's kind of lame to do that. So I added one more method, each, that on many could actually iterate over any function that you got. So then the last line, you can actually count uh, all the words that you find. The interesting thing about this code is that even though it's quite uh, slow and the inside of it uses a little bit of reflection, actually not that much as I expected at the beginning. The user doesn't use any, any, uh, any reflection. Everything, everything in here is uh, reflection free. As soon as you get inside, you get scared by reflection though, but outside it's quite nice to use. So functional Go, is it doable? Yes, 
as long as you don't care about performance. And it require, because it requires a lot of reflection magic going on. But this can be used for inspiration for good APIs. And if functors are able to give us an abstraction over how you apply functions, and it gives us things like link, uh, what could we do with applicative functors or monoids or monads? Uh, many things that I probably don't know. So I'm going to try to keep on learning that and tell you more about that. Merci.